Hi, everyone, and happy Halloween this coming Saturday. That's why I've got on a sparkly, uh, dark night shirt, sort of. I think it reminds me of the stars in the sky when I used to go out Halloween. And uh, I hope that you will be safe from raging COVID. On Monday this week, we had the most beautiful snow here where I live in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And all day the flakes fell straight down because there was no wind and chocolate and fluffy were just fascinated. They, they loved seeing the snow. And by yesterday morning, here's what my backyard table looked like. I got a ruler to measure how deep while chocolate and fluffy watched me stick the ruler into the snow. And it's so sad to see the flowers going. We need the moisture. But I was really uh, sad that we had so much snow and it was covering all of the plants. And uh, it was like they had been growing and were summery the day before and, and then they were covered with snow. So before the snow came, my brother Brad and Chocolate were able to help me move this big perennial canna lily inside where hopefully it will survive this winter and bloom again next summer with its gorgeous pinkish red flowers. This is a photo that Brad took only four weeks ago after this COVID rough year of 2020. It makes me feel wonderful to save this beautiful plant from the cold snow. And if it can bloom again next summer, I would know joy in my soul to see the return of its beautiful blooms, like sort of a cosmic mystery of reincarnation. And there is another cosmic mystery in the news. For the first time ever, Six galaxies have been discovered already formed inside this supermassive black hole reported by the Astronomy Journal on October 2nd. This all happened in the first billion years of our universe. So early that astrophysicists are puzzled about how such a massive black hole could contain six galaxies full of stars so soon in this 13.8 billion year old universe. Back on Earth, another great mystery is how did 30,000 genetic letters of RNA code in a coronavirus that is only one twenty thousandth of a millimeter in size become the worst pandemic killer of humanity in a hundred years. The blue particles here are COVID-19 coronaviruses. They were photographed by a transmission electron microscope at the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, Georgia. COVID is not supposed to be alive, not supposed to have a mind that can think and plot and camouflage its shape-shifting attacks which is what COVID-19 has been doing inside human bodies. Even in people who were at first only mildly sick, there is growing evidence that COVID-19 can continue to damage human brains, hearts, lungs, other organs, veins, and arteries long after the first illness. The Mayo Clinic has reported that, quote, Imaging tests taken months after recovery from COVID-19 have shown lasting damage to the lungs and heart muscle, even in people who had only mild COVID-19 symptoms. The illness can cause very small blood clots that can block capillaries in the heart and permanently injure the heart muscle. The disease can also weaken blood vessels and injure the kidneys and liver, close quote. On top of all that, the idea that herd immunity would eventually control COVID-19 may not be true either. The Imperial College in London found in a recent study that the number of people testing positive for COVID antibodies after having the disease has fallen by 26% 
between June and September of 2020. The rapid fading of the antibodies means there is a significant risk of catching COVID-19 multiple times. Antibodies are the Y-shaped entities in this illustration. Antibodies are supposed to stick to the surface of the coronavirus to stop it invading our body's cells and attacking the rest of the immune system. Imperial College professor Wendy Barclay, PhD, reports about her research of COVID victims, quote, we can see the antibodies and we can see them declining. I would say it looks as if immunity declines away at the same rate as antibodies decline away, close quote. Last week, October 21st, 2020, I share with you my September 2015 recorded interview with Lynn Buchanan, who was one of the Project Stargate controlled remote viewers hired by the CIA and Defense Intelligence Agency for seven years from 1986 to 1992. He had been tasked in Project Stargate to look at the year 2050, which at the time would have been 60 years into the future from 1990 to 2050. And Lynn said that he saw, quote, a largely agrarian society with very few cities and especially almost no large cities the population is very greatly reduced on the earth. But instead of a dramatic nuclear war scenario, Lynn thought that the reduced human population by 2050 was due to environment pollutions of our food, water, and atmosphere. He also saw a variety of other intelligences who include friendlies who are trying to help us become more psychic so we are stronger against the hostile ETs that they have described. Lynn Buchanan's bottom line was there are friendlies, neutrals, and hostiles, with friendlies still trying to help Earth humans in this century, where a lot of problems are expected and life is not guaranteed. When I got off the air last week, I found myself thinking about a recorded interview I did with Jim Mars about his book, Psy Spies, released in 2007. It was also about Project Stargate and controlled remote viewers in the 1980s that included Lynn Buchanan. Probably many of you have read the important books by Jim Mars that made the New York Times bestseller lists, such as Crossfire about the JFK assassination, Alien Agenda about the presence of other intelligences on this planet. Rule by Secrecy about the hidden histories of the Great Pyramids, Freemasons, and Trilateral Commission. And Psy Spies about the CIA's and DIA's controlled remote viewers. Jim Mars was a dear friend from the early 1980s until his sad passing on August 2nd, 2017. And we met first by phone. He called me in 1980 to describe a 35 millimeter color slide that a sheriff showed him at an April 1979 conference about the animal mutilation mystery held in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So that conference was six months before I began my investigation of animal mutilations in September 1979 at the CBS station in Denver, where I was director of special projects. My TV special, A Strange Harvest, was first broadcast in May 1980. Jim saw my documentary and called to tell me that a sheriff at the previous 1979 Albuquerque conference had shown Jim a color slide that had a blue beam of light coming from above down onto a mutilated cow in that frame. During my Strange Harvest production, a few ranchers told me that they had witnessed beams of light coming from unidentified aerial objects 
down into their pastures where they found mutilated animals. And I told Jim, the sheriff Tex Graves in Logan County, Colorado, said straightforwardly, quote, the perpetrators of the bloodless, trackless animal mutilations were creatures from outer space, close quote. Jim Mars had come to the same conclusion, and we shared concerns about the agendas of an alien presence secretly harvesting tissues and fluids from pastures around the world. In 2007, I did a recorded interview for earthfiles.com after Jim released his investigation of controlled remote viewers who worked in Project Stargate for the CIA and NSA. His fascinating book, Psy Spies, The True Story of America's Psychic Warfare Program. As he told me in our 2007 interview, the U.S. government was trying to produce, quote, psychic spies who could remote view anywhere in the world, in the skies, underwater, and even on Earth's moon, Mars, Jupiter, Ganymede, and beyond, close quote. But Jim's book angered some inside of the power bro broker structure. I remember the depressed telephone call I received from Jim after he thought his Psy Spies manuscript had been accepted for publication, but then it was canceled for mysterious reasons, even when he was a celebrated and successful author. So Jim suspected a deliberate government block to keep the highly strange Stargate Enigma files about UFOs hidden from the public and media. I think the reason they had to suppress my book was because after laying a very credible foundation for the science and history of remote viewing, I then went into the Enigma files, which basically is that every single one of these military government trained remote viewers at one time or another had direct personal knowledge of UFOs. Yes. That's what they could not allow to get out in a credible manner. Recent advances in quantum mechanics and quantum physics tend to more and more show us that the entire universe is nothing but one big, huge mass of energy of which we're all part. If someone has a thought or if there's something in the universe, then it's on this universal energy grid. And if anyone is sensitive enough, psychic enough, intuitive, they can actually access the universal grid and to me, that provides a framework for understanding how remote viewing works. Ingo Swan told me his own personal experience in the Pentagon of doing a remote viewing target, only latitude and longitude. And when he began to draw, it was a submarine that had a disc over or to the side of the submarine. Mm -hmm. And when he was asked by the military authority sitting across from him at a desk, you can't mean a UFO, and Ingo responded, yes, I do. At that moment, they gathered up the paper, the pencils. Everybody left the room, leaving Ingo sitting there by himself. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That is a good illustration, actually, of several things. He was not tasked to go see a UFO. He was tasked to go see a submarine. And yet, when he went and viewed the submarine and there was a UFO nearby, obviously his attention was drawn to the UFO, and this is why each and every one of these spies had personal knowledge of the UFOs. I have been told, and I assume that this is true, that they were never at any time tasked to go look at UFOs. Now, Linda, that only makes sense because how could the government, which for 60 years have tried to tell us that there is no such thing, order their official remote viewers to go look at something that they say doesn't exist? But when they went out looking for other things, for example, if they were tasked to go and look in the upper atmosphere for high-performance and high-flying aircraft to see what the Russians or the Chinese or somebody might be testing, they would go up there, they'd see these things splitting through the atmosphere, and they'd go take a mental look at them. And as one remote viewer told me, 
they weren't us and they weren't the Russians. He said those guys weren't even from the neighborhood. In Sci Spies, Jim wrote about the U.S. Army's remote viewing of UFOs in what they called the Enigma Files, and he wrote, quote, Late in 1988, Mel Riley, who was a remote viewer, was working on projects for the U.S. Army. He recalled that their superiors brought them a satellite photograph to study. The photograph showed simply a glowing object. But in remote viewing sessions, the object had humanoid entities in it, and the craft was hovering above a nuclear storage facility. The remote viewer impression was that these visitors were bean counting, taking an inventory of the number of armed warheads at the military depot. When the Psy spies remote viewed and tracked these UFO objects back to their point of origin, the remote viewers found the objects came from subsurface, underground locations on our moon, on Mars, and that they would come and back to the Earth and go into subsurface locations on our planet. Close quote. I asked Jim to explain more details about what the remote viewers found about non-human underground bases on Earth. One of the best and earliest remote viewers was a former police detective named Pat Price, who uh, just by happenstance they stumbled across and brought him into the testing that was being done at SRI. And he proved to be just a tremendous remote viewer. Well, Pat Price would not only do what they asked him to do, but he would take it upon himself to go look at things. And one day he showed up with a report he had written up about these four alien bases that he had seen on the Earth. One of them is in the Pyrenees Mountains between France and Spain. The other is in Zimbabwe in Africa. Another one is located under Mount Hayes in Alaska. And the fourth base was under Mount Zeal in Australia. As I recall, the one in the Pyrenees is a transportation hub. That's where they come and go for off-planet. Maintenance and repair base. Yeah, that's the one in Zimbabwe in Africa. That's where they go for maintenance and repair. The one under Mount Hayes in Alaska is for monitoring the Earth, looking at weather patterns, pollution patterns, finding out what's happening with the Earth. And the, and the one in Australia, apparently, is a rest and recreation area. That's where they all kind of mingle and kind of hang out. Apparently, remote viewers had come across several different species. If remote viewers talk about ETs, we would talk about the diminutive grays. I think the lizards were also mentioned. I think remote viewers see all of these on the four bases the transportation center of the pyramids seems to be primarily under control of the little grays, but they see them working with each other at certain other bases. You have interviewed Lynn Buchanan and Mr. McMonagall and Morehouse and Mel Riley, who have been very good at remote viewing. Has anybody talked to you privately about seeing specific details of non-humans? Oh, yes. Yes. At one point, when remote viewers were discussing amongst themselves these occurrences of remote viewing UFOs, and they were discussing where they come from, what are they all about, the remote viewers decided, well, why don't, instead of talking about these random sightings that we're seeing, why don't we just track it right back to the source, figure out where the control point is. They actually tasked Mel Riley to go take a look at what they could only describe as intergalactic federation headquarters, okay? And he ended up with a very, very bizarre experience. He ended up in a mountainous area with a very large plateau and a huge lake that he equated to something similar to Lake Titicaca and that there was a huge ziggurat there or pyramid with a sloping ramp, which he ascended, 
And inside the pyramid was a huge room with a dais in the center of it, and that they were hooded figures standing around there, and that the prominent emotion he felt was happiness and joy at almost a homecoming. It was like he had been there before, and he went over and lay on the dais while a beam of light came down and enshrouded him, and he just said he had a complete feeling of well-being and being home to the point to where he really didn't want to come back, but they ended the session, and he came back to his 3D material existence. But what did he see in terms of physical features of the hooded entities? Um, I don't believe he ever got any clear picture of who these hooded figures were. Now, keep in mind, the remote viewers, several of them, have told me that not only have they seen various extraterrestrials of various visage, as you pointed out, the grays, the reptilians, tall, blonde, Nordics, but they have also seen beings of energy and light, which remote viewers call transcendentals. So there is just a whole wide spectrum of life out there, and some of it is not even on the material plane of existence as we are. Did Mel Riley come away with any sense of the agenda of these hooded figures that the whole reason for the remote viewing was to go back to the source controlling the non-human interaction with the Earth? Right. I think that this gets past the three-dimensional material plane and shows us that there are other planes of existence And it gets into what I guess I could only call the spiritual, and that we are all beings of energy, and that uh, as such we're all connected, and that when we come and are relegated to this 3D material plane of existence, we're all here, kind of like going to kindergarten. (laughs) We're here to learn some lessons, to learn how to uh, get along in a material world, perhaps just to experience the material world, and that at some point we will again graduate and we will again become part of the energy whole of the universe, which is omniscient and omnipresent and pretty well fits the definition of God. The remote viewers had all kinds of strange and exotic experiences. That's why I say in my book, Sci-Fi, that if you get into this, your life will never be the same because you will be so much expanded in consciousness. Mel Riley, for example, he said they really had problems with this sci-fi unit because they were tasked to go look at Russian submarines. And as Mel Riley said, when you go out and look throughout the universe, you know, who wants to go look at a Russian submarine? (laughs) Look who came and jumped up, basically saying, okay, I played my game, now I want to be in your lap too, because chocolate was. So in this show tonight, we've gotten both of them just not all at the same time. And uh, I'm so glad that they only play the game at the beginning at 7.30, and then they always come back. So I'm going to start picking them up when they come in to encourage them. All right, baby. So fluffy and chocolate. And Jim would have loved it because Jim Mars was a man of soul and wit and one of the funniest people and most delightful people to be around in my entire life. And I was thinking tonight, listening to his voice again, that I saw him a couple of months before he passed. And it was for television and a conference. And it's ironic that one of the very subjects that we were talking about that last time that I saw Jim was that question that he and I had kicked around over the years. Why are we in a universe where everything has to eat something else to survive? Why are we on a planet where war seems to have been endemic from the very first memory when Jim and I had both talked with 
others about the whole issue of the soul and what humanity's true source might be. And that I didn't know that he was going to pass a couple of months later. But in that conversation, I remember that we both said, it's so odd that after all of these years and knowing that the truth is that we're not alone in this universe, and that, as Lynn Buchanan had remote viewed, there were friendlies, neutrals, and hostiles. That what we were both saying to each other that night, why isn't it more clear what is friendly, what is neutral, what is hostile, and what is the true, honest relationship, at least between the United States government and other intelligences out there. And Jim had also heard that we had interstellar trade, which I think is absolutely a fact. Why don't we understand agendas? Meaning those of us who have been exposed to whistleblowers. We don't have clarity on what is friendly, what is neutral, and what is hostile. And Jim said, what if, what if MJ-12 and the power brokers in the government are as confused as we are about the true agendas and the real motives? And on this night of October 28, 2020, I think it's still a relevant question. We don't have official confirmation and we don't have private clarity as much as some of us have been exposed to people who have seen and communicated directly with extraterrestrial biological entities in their work. And even they are confused. So hold that as a ground for going forward into 2021. I hope we're going to get that headline, but that there may be a lot of confusion. Sometimes I think that something was going in one direction and then something changed and they're not really sure. And in that regard, um, I will throw it out to you as an audience tonight at the end of October, 2020. For those of you who have firsthand information, whether from intelligence, from military or from wherever, if you can write me, email me, proton mail, if you have any information that you think is firm and factual about agendas. It seems that we deal with a lot of camouflage, a lot of holograms, a lot of deceptions, as Jacques Vallée wrote in his very important book, Messengers, of deception. And Jim also, that was the, another part of our subject, that it's so hard to know what the true agendas are when there is what seems to be so much camouflage, so much deception, and so much invisibility as part of the alien interaction with this planet, whether they're based here, based in our solar system, based somewhere else. We aren't dealt with straightforwardly either by them any more than we are uh, handled by the government. The government is as uh, deceptive with us uh, humans as it appears that the aliens are as well, which adds to the confusion. So on that note, I throw back this. I hope that you uh, value what we tried to do tonight, because I felt that between Lynn Buchanan and Jim Mars and the work in Psy Spies, uh, there were so many emails from some of you about wanting to know more about remote viewing and what remote viewers have said, that I thought maybe this would uh, be a good way to put this in part one. And next Wednesday on November, uh, Fourth, 
it, I think it's the fourth, <laughs> um, that we are going to have a second part with uh, Jim Mars that is also equally fascinating. And with that, Peggy, uh, I would love to know what people's comments and questions are uh, on tonight. Hi, Linda. First, I'd like to thank everybody for their super chats. So thank you, Moonbird, Cat Chaser, Mary Kelly, Melissa, Jeffrey Rizzo, Tate, Eric Ackerley, Chad Mitchell, Kendall 190, Nicey J, Traveling Leon, Ladybird Beyond, Vicky Martinez, Brock Landers, Dolan's Bar, Isabella Pacetti, Demon Hordes, Rebecca Pump, Din, and My Container Garden. Thank you, everyone. Wow. Thank you, and happy Halloween. And uh, as we go forward, I just can't thank you guys enough uh, because it helps make me feel like uh, that you all are getting value from what I hope that you will get value from. So thank you very much. Question. Our first question yeah. uh, viewer asks, when do you believe the first references to portholes to other dimensions or universes first appeared in our recorded history? Probably in biblical literature, like the Ezekiel wheel, because Ezekiel seemed to be out someplace when, uh, at least depending upon what version that you read, it was just suddenly the appearance of rings within rings within rings. And that to me sounds like the description of somebody uh, 2,000 years ago who would have known zero, would have no concept, no language for portals, other dimensions, moving point to point throughout the universe. But something like the appearance of something coming with rings within rings within rings, that may have been a portal opening. But uh, <laughs> dear Ezekiel didn't know how, what to say and describe, but I still find that part of biblical literature uh, to be as close to a description of something that would fall into the category of seeing a round UFO uh, as today. So that would be one that I would consider as possibly whatever showed up might have come through a portal. But on the other side of that is the question, do the non-humans have technology in which they can provoke by manipulation of magnetic fields, a portal anywhere that they wanted? Or do they have to work through planets, moons, astronomical bodies that have magnetic fields so that they can manipulate specifically magnetic fields to collapse into creating a portal? I'm not sure about the chicken and the egg, whether the conditions have to be right on certain planetary bodies to create uh, the portals where they create them, or can they use technology to create them anywhere? And that alone, if they could, then the whole landscape of our Earth history and humanity uh, would be one in which there were really strange uh, events that have been described that often involve some kind of beam. It may be that was portal technology. At least I think that it helps a lot to look <clears throat> back in history at uh, so many different literatures, uh, spiritual, religious, geophysical, and then put them through the lens of what we are learning today about a universe that appears to have multiple dimensions, multiple timelines, and, and nobody knew that then. So what a universe we live in. What about another question? 
a viewer would like your opinion on what your thoughts are about Lynn Buchanan's remote viewing of 2050, where the population of mankind is much smaller than it is now. Yes, I've had a lot of emails from you also about uh, last week's uh, program. And Lynn and I have talked about that a lot as well. And the fact that the Stargate remote viewers, of which Lynn was a part, uh, more than one, saw a future in 2050 where there was a de uh, decline in population. I said last week, and I feel just as strongly, that if in 2050 the remote viewers, even going all the way back uh, 60 years, if 2050, the Earth was still here, still a surface, still humans, even if the population was reduced, not seeing a lot of cities, um, I think Lynn told me that it appeared to be cleaner and fresher after a, a period that he associated with um, a lot of problems with the atmosphere and maybe even contributions from volcanoes. But the reduced population, whatever it is that specifically causes it, we are right now in a COVID pandemic and population is going down as long as we are not controlling and getting on top of that COVID. So between pandemics between earthquakes, between natural geophysical events, between problems that might exist in the atmosphere because of things that are going to come that, that I don't know anything about and none of us do yet. 2050, from everybody having seen it, in terms of doing remote viewing or the clairvoyant in France, we're still here. And a reduced population may, in the big picture, it can be looked at as possibly a positive in the sense that there are people and not so many cities, more agrarian, closer to the land, and what is not in that equation, and I don't know if, if a remote viewing from 60 years back should be so accurate that it would have this part of the equation, but what I'm going to add, if Elon Musk is successful and that his star ships as he said, in, by 2024, he hopes that he'll have a relay of them taking eventually a million people from Earth to Mars. If that were happening simultaneously with changes on the Earth, it may be that there is separation or the beginning of separations of populations going to other places. The other part, too, of the equation that we don't know, if we are introduced let's say in 2021, to we're not alone in the universe. Will that then set in motion the introduction of friendlies, friendly ETs introduced to the planet for how they've helped, how they've been helping, how they will help, and something that none of us really have any information about if the friendlies that want humanity to survive became part of an introduction to other life in the universe, would it then involve the friendlies taking humans to their planet and bringing them back and taking them to the, another planet? Would we, in this century, really start getting into uh, astrophysical travel to other places because we would have the help 
of the friendly non-humans. And if Jim were sitting here, he'd say, the part then that we need to know is how will the friendlies prove to the whole human population on Earth that they really don't intend any deceptive uh, takeover? People are worried about that. The friendly ETs, no matter which ones, the blondes, the grays, reptilians, the praying mantises, or all of them in some form or combination. Some people say it's just too big a hurdle and uh, the, the, the earth will never be able to handle the introduction to things that don't look like people. And I've always had an instant reaction to that. Kids love dinosaurs and spiders and all sorts of strange things. So I think it's how you condition young people as they grow. And that if we do have that confirmation from the power brokers that we're not alone in the universe, it comes with an introduction of one, two, or three friendly, neutral, some combination, then the introduction by humans of non-humans to us, the human family, I think that has a high percentage of working. I don't think that it necessarily means that there's going to be panic or uh, all of the things that once upon a time people uh, after 1938 and Orson Welles said, oh, the humans couldn't handle it. I just completely disagree. And maybe the part that we haven't specifically heard from the uh, remote viewers in a task is the year. What would be the year that humans, Homo sapiens sapien, and greys, and Nordics, and reptiles, and praying mantises, and others stand together on a stage, in a presentation to this world, maybe linked in with other worlds, in which we haven't been able in our mind's eye to imagine what it could be if we exponentially go a huge leap from being struggling, warring, tribal humans on Earth to a family of humans that start moving into the solar system and that the next big step is we become galactic. At that point, it seems impossible to imagine that there would still be war on Earth. And to me, Lynn Buchanan and Stan Friedman and I one time, we, we talked about that for a long time. What, what will it take to get Homo sapien sapien on Earth out of tribal warfare? Tribes can be small or big. China, Russia, and the United States are in tribal warfare. What happens? Could ETs that are friendly and know a lot more about the universe than we do, could they help us get past that point? I guess that's the kind of world and universe that I would like to live in. And that is the kind of world and universe that I hope the images of 2050 of a less populated but still world alive planting crops and who knows, maybe in a public way, interacting with non-humans or taking us off to other places 
that might be a reason why there might be less people in less cities. Well, in that positive quote, in that positive space, let's try to think about that and not thinking that 2050 will necessarily be negative. S swing positive, push your soul positive. If we all did that, maybe 2050 would be positive. What about another question? Another viewer would love to know, what is the darkness that surrounds the universe that the majestic agent spoke to you about? It is a very good question. I am working on a project about that. And one of my private goals is, I know that I won't have the project mature enough in uh, the remaining two months of this year. Can you believe that? Two months, November, December, because we're essentially there. Just two months left of 2020. But what I can say of what I'm learning if there is a cold, dark sea that's incomprehensible and it surrounds every universe that exists because that was the quote like grains of sand on a beach every grain of sand a universe take this universe 13.8 billion light years multiply it by infinity that's what that quote was about Universes, like grains of sand, so many, surrounded by a cold, dark sea. And the peace of positiveness that I have been learning about, not that it's the whole story, but that I can tell you tonight, is that whatever the nature of that cold, dark sea truly is, that what I'm beginning to understand is that the proliferation of universes to infinity, grains of sand, so many, an island of universes. It is the island, huge, infinite number of all of those universes that gives strength from universe to universe to universe, dimensions and timelines, no matter what the cold, dark sea is that surrounds them. Hang on to that. Now, in 2021, I might have the ability to expand that story. How about another question? I guess this is a question that many viewers have asked. Why won't a single alien come to tell us that they're real? They can easily prove it by going live on TV, but none ever have. I've been with fellow colleagues about that very question. Why don't the non-humans just present themselves, especially the friendly ones, to all of us on the planet. And if Jim Mars were here, he would say maybe it's because it's not in the interests of the ETs for people to know that they are here, that they are here on this planet. They have been here for at least 270 million years that they have huge installations that are deep beneath the basins of the seas, the water has been used as a protection, and that for 270 million years at least, it's been cohabitation. And then you get into the next darker area, animal mutilations, human abductions, descriptions of 
extraction of sperm, extraction of eggs. And there's no question in my mind, there was no question in Jim Marr's mind, that one of the interactions on Earth clearly was genetic, that some, all of the non-humans are harvesting from Earth. They harvest genetic material, they harvest inorganic, they harvest gold, they harvest the valuable metals that we also need. So the whole issue of the motive and why they wouldn't stand up in front of us is probably right now one of the most important questions for all of us to think about. And is there something that would fall into the category of a treaty? There are the suggestions that Dwight Eisenhower, when he was president, did a treaty with some form of non-humans, maybe uh, in California. And what was the nature of that treaty? Well, there have been suggestions that the government said, yes, you can have the right to abduct a few people, the right to abduct a few animals, but uh, we want limits. You can argue, oh my gosh, would a president of the United States treaty away our right as uh, humans to ha have a yes or no about whether or not we were abducted by extraterrestrial biological entities who wanted our eggs, wanted sperm, wanted whatever they want. I have never personally been able to get myself into a position of, I wouldn't do this, I wouldn't do that, I would do this, I would do that. Nothing is that clear because we don't have any of the true, true facts directly from, we'll call it the other intelligence. We have had this geopolitical power broker line that has been drawn between what the general family of humans are allowed to know about and understand versus controllers, the controllers of humanity, which could be both human and non-human, versus something out there that is not friendly. And a lot of times I have been told, Linda, decisions have been made to keep things from the public because the public couldn't handle it. Well, look at how much we have been talking about on the Earth Files YouTube channel broadcast for the last four years. I think that we have been talking in a constructive way about many subjects that could be introduced to the whole planet. People argue and say, no, it would destroy religions. I don't understand that at all. If the universe is actually an infinite number of universes and the divine field is outside of all of that, then the idea that there are infinite number of other intelligences seems to me that just expands the incomprehensible importance of trying to relate to any kind of a force that would have the ability to produce something that would be an infinite number of universes, whether they're surrounded by a cold, dark sea or not. So maybe part of this bucking horse time that we're in, where it's red states versus blue states and all of the words, I don't have to say them, that have become so uh, political, that we have, to, we have to grow up out of ourselves and our tribalism and get onto a ground it may be in 2050 when the 
population is spread out more. Maybe what we're headed toward because it's necessary is a period of time where there is going to be all kinds of stress, but out of the stress, maybe we will grow up more and finally we will start becoming at least Milky Way galactic. So none of these questions, none of them have easy answers. And I understand that. But to tell you the truth, it's the fact that there are no easy answers, that there are so many mysteries, that there is even the concept that we're in something so huge that there's an infinite number of universes. That excites me. It makes me want to learn more and more every day of my life. And when you're excited by learning in a thousand directions, I think it gives a reason for saying, we are going to go on, you guys. This form is going to go on. I think we will have help. And I pray that it will be positive and that we will come closer to understanding more the relationship of our soul that animates and the soul connects to the divine field that made it all in the first place. So I, I love your questions. I'm, I'm struggling with them myself. And I just try to give you my current thoughts. Now, I think time for one more question. Uh, a viewer asked tonight, if aliens are so advanced, why do they continue to repeatedly mutilate, uh, mutilate animals to harvest gen genetic material? Shouldn't they be able to re reproduce those animals on their own? I love these questions tonight. They are all the questions that I myself have agonized over and sometimes in discussions with Jim Mars because Jim was very interested in the animal mutilations as well. It goes back to one of the first statements that I remember from Sheriff Tex Graves. Uh, he said, Linda, we don't understand if we're dealing with creatures from outer space, why do they bother to take the animal we understand but why do they bother to put the animal back down in the same pasture where it was with the very clear and vivid ear, eye, jaw flesh, tongue, genitals, rectum removed? It's in our faces. It's flaunted. And then the sheriff and I talked about what would it mean if we're dealing with what he kept saying were creatures from outer space who flaunted their ability to take up an animal in a beam of light, take the same patterns of excisions, leave no blood, no fluid, because whatever it is that they're using is heating the edges, cooking the hemoglobin and the collagen, and then putting it back down knowing First thing that law enforcement and ranchers look at is where are the tracks of what took this animal down and going all the way back to the 1960s. That was one of the things that people noticed that there are no tracks. So how did the animal get to where it is lying with all of the surgery? So if advanced intelligence flaunts and has been doing so not just since the 20th century, but probably going back to, I, I'm going to say, to the time of the Anunnaki. If the Anunnaki were the tall ETs who built ziggurats and 
pyramids and were the first wave before what we know as the Egyptians. If they had blood sacrifices or something akin having to do with animals, it may be that there is some relationship between putting back onto the planet Earth after they have taken what they've needed, that is like un, unwritten words and un, you don't need to say anything more because everybody begins to catch on if there are no hoof prints, footprints around a mutilated animal in which there's no blood, then you stand back and you say, this animal had to be put down to this position from something that had the ability to put the animal down without any tracks around it. The next word that comes into the discussion after flaunting is that all of that adds up to intimidation. I remember talking to a rancher who said, I saw that beam, I saw the beam come down from this light in the sky, came right into my cattle pasture, and he said, I ran back to the house, and I wasn't going to go back out there until the sun came up. And that's intimidation is the intimidation to control humanity on the surface by those that occupy our planet deeper, deeper below, and that if they have a certain intimidation on what they do on the surface, that they're not going to be bothered by humans? Is that part of their motivation? Just keep an edge and people run away? Well, that's the opposite of what I was talking about earlier, which would be finally uh, working with the friendlies who want us to evolve, who want us to be stronger. Um, maybe there's tension between those and what does the animal mutilations. Maybe they are in some kind of conflict. The suggestion has been made to me that it may be the reptilians who do the mutilations and the Nordics and the Greys and others don't like it, but that it is not uh, perfect. It's not perfect. The universe has a lot of conflict in it. And that would be the best I can say is that law enforcement uh, themselves, ha in talking with me, the question was, is this flaunting? If it's flaunting, is it intimidation? But it's been going on for so many decades. I have done so much reporting. And the mutilations come sort of more precisely. France in this year, I think, has been startling in the number of cases. Why France? Why now? What is the reason for such a huge harvest from the horses of France? I don't have an answer. But with your help, all of you around the world, if you can let me know what's happening where you are that falls into one of these high strangeness categories, whether it's mutilations or lights or beams or whatever, then you all begin to be more aware of the patterns that are related to non-humans. And you get in touch with me. I will try to do reports when I can. And that begins to start this energy on this planet, which I think we need drastically, that it's okay to talk about extraterrestrial biological entities in this universe, in this solar system, in this planet, throughout the universe, and that 
in the end, if we could all share in the truth that the power brokers know, it could be the key to all of humanity surviving not only on Earth, but reaching out to Mars and beyond. So on that note tonight, I wish you healthy, happy Halloween in a time when it feels like we're being picked up and shaken almost like a rag doll from everything that we knew in 2019. But if you are practicing being safe and we get into 2021 and we have vaccines, then think of how much stronger every one of us will be about so many layers that we didn't even realize we had inside of ourselves to make it through one of the worst pandemics the humans have ever faced. I love you guys. Feel a digital hug now and forever. And I'll see you next week for part two with Jim Mars.